Okay, so uh, again, I'm, uh, in order to understand Hanukkah, I was going back a little bit. Again, just to remind you, uh, from the Chorban of Nebuchadnezzar until Cyrus, until the Persian Empire, is 52 years. And interestingly enough, from the conquest by the Persian Empire to the fall of the Persian Empire by Alexander the Great is also 52 years. Uh, and the way it works is that for the 52 years after the Chorban, Eretz Yisrael was totally desolate. Uh, but the Beis Hamikdash, uh, the Jews began to return after 52 years, but ultimately the Beis Hamikdash uh, did not start to be built in earnest until 18 years after that. So therefore, from Chorban to, Chor to Binyan is 70 years, which is exactly what Yirmiyahu said the Gullus would, would be. Uh, and that was in the second year of Darius. Uh, and then uh, 30, I'm sorry, uh, 34 years later, right, 34 years later was the conquest, the Greek conquest. Uh, Alexander, as we said, died, died relatively young, and his empire was divided among four different generals. And for our purposes, the uh, southern kingdom, which included Egypt and North Africa, was ruled by the Ptolemaic dynasty, Ptolemy HaMelech. And uh, the Syria, Turkey, was ruled by Seleucus, the Seleucid dynasty. And Eretz Israel in the middle was a subject of wars that took place over hundreds of years. And this was prophesied in the book of Daniel when Daniel talks about the king of the north and the king of the south. And it's very, very clear that he is referring to this. And he, he had this Navua during the Babylonian exile way before uh, these things happened. Now, let me go back a little bit. I mentioned yesterday the Medrash Rabbah that sees the four exiles, Marumas, in the Lushan of the Taira itself, right? The world was Tayu. Tayu means astonishingly empty. Vayu is jumbled and confused. Choshech, darkness. Al Pinei to home on the face of the depths. Veruach Elohim Merachefes Al Pinei Amayim. The spirit of Hashem is hovering over the water. So you'll remember what the Medra says. Tayu, the notion of emptiness, refers to Bavel. And Bayu, confusion, refers to Persia. And darkness refers to Yavan. And Pnei Tahaim refers to the Gullus of Rome that Chazal always identified as the Gullus of Edom, the Gullus of, of Esav and the like. And the Ruach Elohim Rachevaz al Pnei Amoyim is a remez to Hashem bringing a Geula, bringing a Moshiach in the merit of Torah that is compared to water. So in the very beginning of Bereshus, there is a statement regarding the unfolding of these four exiles. Now, let's stop for a moment here. I'm going to go out of order a little bit. That is, according to Chazal, we are still in the Golos of Edaim. The name of our Golos is Golos Edaim. Right? We're not in Golos Bavel. That was only 52 years. We're not in Golos Persia. That was 52 years. We're not in Golos Yavan. That happened to be 180 years. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We are in Golos Edaim. And Edom is said, Edom is Asaph, and Edom is said to be the last exile until the coming of Mashiach. So, just very simple, just in terms of Pshat, why is this called the Golos of Edom? Number one, the Roman Empire fell quite a few years ago. Now, as you know, the Roman Empire eventually divided into two. There's the Western Roman Empire in Rome, and then there's the Byzantine Empire called the Eastern Roman Empire in Constantinople. Uh, but both of them are gone. The Western Roman Empire, the typical date that's given, although it's not even clear what it means the Roman Empire fell, it was a gradual process of, of, of disintegration. But the official date in the history books is 476 quite a long time ago. And the uh, Byzantine Empire did survive much, much longer, but the famous date is 1453. It's actually a very, very famous date. It's very much celebrated uh, in the Islamic world because that is when the Islamic world overthrew Byzantium, which was a Christian empire. 
right? The, the, the Eastern Roman Empire was Christian. Constantine had converted the empire officially uh, to Christianity. So if that's so, if you're making the connection that Edaim is Rome, first of all, even that is a bit of a question, Mehechi Tesi, that the Romans are descended from uh, Asa, but okay, but Chazal make that assumption that Rome is identified with Edaim, Edaim is Asaph. The question is, why are we still in the Golos of Edaim if there is no Roman Empire? Yeah, there's a country called Italy, but you know, one, one wouldn't call Italy some empire uh, in, some, in some ways. I mean, they have good, uh, good pizza, but okay, you know. So, so here is the thing. There are a few reasons why this Golos is still called the Golos of Edaim. The simplest reason is because although we are not under their domination, but the damage they inflicted has not been reversed. The Romans destroyed the second Beis Hamikdash and exiled the Jewish people from their land. Okay, Rome is gone, but we still don't have a Beis Hamikdash and we still have so much of the Jews not living in Eretz Yisrael. Although, Baruch Hashem, it's gotten a lot better. So answer number one is, you are in the Golas of Edaim until the damage that Edaim inflicted is reversed, and that damage has not yet been reversed. Okay, so that's an important idea. So we're not in Golas Edaim in the sense that Edaim is ruling over us, but what they did to us, we're still suffering from. That's answer number one. Answer number two is that the Roman Empire itself morphed even after its disintegration. In many ways, Western civilization as a whole uh, comes from the Roman Empire. Now, now, actually, Western civilization as a whole comes from Greece. Greece created the philosophy. Greece created the mathematics. Greece created the science, etc. But it was the Roman Empire that spread all of these ideas throughout the world, through their empire building, and that became the foundation of what later became Western civilization, first in Europe and then in the United States. So as a result, when we talk about being the Golas of Edaim, that actually means we're under the grip and we're under the influence of Western civilization. And it has been the case that a majority of the population of the Jews have been subject to Western civilization, both in terms of philosophy and in terms of people that rule over us and oppress us and the like. Now, one can also add that in addition, because it's really intimately connected, to Rome equaling Western civilization, it's also true that Rome became the seat of Christianity. Uh, right, as I mentioned yesterday, the first uh, pope, the bishop, uh, technically, uh, you know, it's interesting. Technically, uh, the Pope was not necessarily originally, he wasn't even called the Pope. He was not necessarily the head of the Catholic Church. He was a bishop. So the, there's the Bishop of Rome and there's the Bishop of Indianapolis and, and the Bishop of Albany, New York. He was just a bishop like other bishops. But eventually, the Bishop of Rome became the head of the whole uh, Catholic Church. Um, and uh, the seat of the Bishop of Rome was, of course, Rome. Now it's Vatican City, which is part of Rome, but it's within the city of Rome. So when we talk about Golos Edda, and we are also referring to the notion that the fate of the Jews is bound with uh, the Christian Church, meaning to say we were under their rule, we were under their authority, we were under their threats for thousands of years, and therefore, that is still Golos Edom. So therefore, there are a number of reasons why we're still in the Golos of Edom. Uh, number one, because the Chorban Beis Hamikdash of the Romans has never got reversed. Uh, number two, uh, Rome eventually morphed into Western civilization. And number three, uh, Rome became the seat of Christianity, which uh, had a decisive impact on the Jewish nation over all of these years, the Crusades, and everything and everything else. Now, in that way, even though eventually, you know, there was the Protestant Reformation later, so then Rome was no longer the seat of all Christianity, but there's no question that it was the Shorish, meaning, yeah, there were breakaways, but, but essentially Rome was, was it. Rome was considered to be the dominant power in that, in that way. So as a result, 
Even though the Gullus of Bavel was only 52 years, and the Gullus of Persia was 52 years, and the Gullus of Yavan was 180 years, the Gullus of Edaim is described al pene tahom, the depths al pene tahom, because it's a Gullus that even in the time of Chazal had already been much longer than the other Gulluses, and then we'll just add all of the years since, uh, since Chazal. Now, the idea that there are four Gullises is actually seen in Tanakh. In the book of Daniel in particular, which is a very, very fascinating book. It's not uh, learned that much, unfortunately, but there's a tremendous amount of things in it uh, that are interesting, enigmatic, puzzling about Moshiach, about the Kates. There are repeated visions uh, which are connected to four. There are four animals coming up from the sea. There are four metals in a statue, etc. And all of this is a remiss to the four Malchias. Chazal, over and over again, always defined the four Malchias in the way that we've described. Bavel, Paras, Yavan, Edaim, and we are still in the Golas of Edaim. That is how Ma'osur does it as well. The, every stanza in Ma'osur is connected uh, the the Golias, including Mitzrayim, which is like the pre Golas Golas, uh, and the like. However, the Eben Ezra in Sefer Daniel, or Avram Eben Ezra, takes a very strong issue. Of course, he always argues with Chazal, so I mean, that's what the Eben Ezra does. But he says, you know, Chazal are ignoring something very, very powerful. And that is, in the Eben Ezra's time, which was in the 10 hundreds, the 11th century, much of the Jewish world, and maybe a majority of the Jewish world, were not under Christian rule, which you could connect to the Roman Empire, they were under Muslim rule. They were under the rule of Mohammed, the rule of um, this dominant Malchus, which is descended from Yishmael, right? Our belief is uh, that uh, the uh, Arabs, now, now again, people get a little confused here. Uh, Yishmael had nothing to do with Islam, that's for sure. Islam <laughs> was invented as a religion much, much, much later. So when we say the Muslims are from Yishmael, we don't mean the religion of Islam is connected to Yishmael. We are simply making a claim regarding the Arab people, that Arabs are said to be descendants from Yishmael, and it makes no difference if they're Christian Arabs or Muslim Arabs or the like. So keep in mind, most Arabs are Muslims, but there are, number one, non-Arab Muslims, such as Iranians, who are not from Yishmael, <clears throat> and the other way around, there are non-Muslim Arabs. Okay, so the connection of Mus Islam to Yishmael is not Islam to Yishmael, it's Arab to Yishmael. Be sure you understand that particular idea. Uh, but in the time of the Ebenezer, Ezra, the Islamic conquests were very, very widespread, and much of the Jewish world were subjugated to the rule of Islam. And Islam was an immensely great power in those days. By the way, not only were they politically a great power, but they, in fact, even culturally, were far superior to Christian Europe. Christian Europe, in those centuries, in the 10 hundreds and the like, was in what was called the Dark Ages. Uh, illiterate, uh, boorish, uh, and the people who preserved the classical culture of Aristotle, Greece, and Rome were, in fact, the Muslims. So they were politically very powerful. They were ruthless warriors, and they also had tremendous culture. In fact, uh, one of the mysteries of history, in fact, Bernard Lewis, well, I, I think he may have been Jewish, I'm not sure, but he was considered to be, he was a professor, he was considered to be the world's expert on Islam. Uh, not alive anymore. He wrote a famous book, like something like, I don't remember the exact title, something like, Whatever Happens, meaning to say, uh, Islam had been, in the Middle Ages, not, not only politically powerful and militarily great, but they had been a tremendous culture of erudition, of science, of mathematics, of literature. And today, granted, they have a lot of economic power because of oil, but you know, it's basically backward and the like. And uh, it, historically, it's a little difficult. Like, what happened? Why did uh, Islamic culture decline to such a degree that like, there's nothing going on there other than revolution, other than violence? and the like. So it's actually a historical puzzle 
as to what's going on. But be this it may, I, I don't want to you know, give a seminar on, on uh, the rise and fall of Islam, but the Eben Ezra simply raises the question, why do Chazal ignore Malchus Yishmael? Now, a historian would simply answer, but this would be a secular answer. A historian would answer, well, Chazal wrote the Gemara and the Medrash before the rise of Muhammad. Muhammad is after the period of Chazal. So Chazal only knew about Rome. They didn't know about Islam. There was no Islam yet. But still, we're assuming that Chazal understood the course of human history. Why didn't they factor in the ascendancy of Ishmael? So because of this, the Eben Ezra takes a radically different position regarding how you count the four exiles. And this is how he does it. Exile number one is Bavel. Exile number two is Persia. That's the same. Exile number three is Greece slash Rome. You count Yavan and Edim as one continuous Gallus, because after all, the culture of Rome was based on Greece. And the fourth Gallus is Gallus Yishmael, the power of Yishmael. And the Eben Ezra believed that Gallus Yishmael would be the last Gallus before Mashiach. Now, this is the Eben Ezra's interpretation in the book of Daniel, that the four exiles are Bavel, Paras, Yavan Edaim, and Yishmael. But once again, there's no question that that's against Chazal. Chazal always say that the fourth exile is the exile of Edom, right? That's what Chazal say, right? I mean, the Eben Ezra can, well, he, he argues with Chazal, so to speak. He, inter he interprets, by the way, that's also a very interesting question because you might be saying, hey, what do you mean he argues? What do you mean he argues with Chazal? The Eben Ezra was a Rishon. Uh, Rishon cannot argue with Chazal, but, but the Eben says the Rishonim themselves took the position that if something was not no geya la halacha, if it was not a matter of halacha, it was a matter of biblical interpretation, they held that they do have permission to offer interpretations that are at variance with Chazal because it's a matter of biblical interpretation. This, by the way, is an issue that is resurfaced in this very moment. I've mentioned before, again, I don't want to be marich in it too much, uh, the banning of a very good Sefer on Chumash called Pshuto Shal Mikra. And one of the condemnations of Pshuto Shal Mikra is that they are offering explanations, not Keneged Chazal, just even Keneged Rashi already, and they say, you're not allowed to do that. Well, what I would say is that the Meforshim had a Mahalach, not only could you offer Pshatim Keneged Rashi, you could offer Pshatim even Keneged Chazal, uh, if it's not Nogei Allah Okay, but be it as it may, that's the Eben Ezra. Yeah. Um, why does the Ebenezer not say that, you know, look, they say uh, Islam is, I don't know if it's like, an, I wouldn't say it's an offshoot of Christianity, but it comes from the idea that, that uh, Yoshke was one of the, uh, what was the Navi himself, yeah. and, that it, and that they believe that, so it's like an offshoot of Christianity, and if one of the interpretations is, that's why we're still in the exile of Edo, because he could have he said something like that, yes, the people who follow that predominantly, yeah. are people from Yishmael, but still, it's technically a Christian influence, mm -hmm. Roman influence. It, it, could, it could be, you know, you know what you're saying has, has, uh, is a good point. Uh, I, I think the problem is, though, that uh, Judaism was a much more powerful influ direct influence on Islam than was Christianity. Mohammed was a camel driver, you know, he, that was his job. And he hung around a lot of Jews uh, who hired him and the like. And uh, Muhammad had a vivid imagination. And when he would hear them talking about Midrashim and stories, he really, he wasn't so much into Hilchah Shabbos like Borer, he wasn't really going into. <laughs> but he loved Midrashim. He loved stories and he loved parables. And he took them in. And it's, I think it's recorded in some sources that he actually wanted to convert to Judaism. He thought, you know, uh, he'd have a nice Shabbos off and... Uh, and he heard nice stories, but he was not deemed a suitable candidate, I guess, because he didn't want to take on the mitzvahs or, and the like. And uh, he started uh, his own thing. But it was very, very much based on Judaism. There, there actually were not a lot of Christians where he was. So I think it would be a little tenuous to claim Christianity. Obviously, he incorporated Yashka into his pantheon of righteous prophets. But I think it would be dochak to ascribe Christianity 
ergo Rome as a dominant influence in what he was doing. Yeah. Regarding the definition of Yishmalim, um, it's commonly referred to, uh, this is what I thought as well, whether it's referring to the Muslims as a whole, you just clarified that it's referring to the whole Arab world. Yes. When the Rambam writes that there's been no one that's persecuted us like the Yishmalim. That's correct. What is he referring to? Because he was in Spain, and then he had to flee all the way to Egypt. Yep. But the Muslims that infiltrated Spain were the Berbers, the Almogoros, and the Omarites from North Africa. Is that still considered Arab? Yeah, apparently the Rambam considered them Arabic, because the Rambam uh, is defining Yishmael as uh, the father of the Arab nations, not necessarily Islam. Even then, he's not making a claim that there's been no one that's persecuted us as much as the Muslims. He's just saying that as much as the Arabs. Well, well, well y that's true, but... but he is referring to Islamic persecutions. I mean, the persecutions that we suffered from the Arabic nations were in the cause of Islam. So it was Islamic persecution, but, but coming from B'nai, coming from B'nai Ishmael. B'nai Ishmael were the persecutors. Yeah. Um, what's, what would the Nafkimina be if the fourth Gauls is Edaim or... Say again, didn't hear you. What would the Nafkimina be if the fourth Gauls is Edaim or Ishmael? Well, the question would be that, uh, again, the Ebenezer Ezra believed that Mashiach would be coming in his days, and it could have come, and he was pointing out that most of the Jewish world was not under the domination of Edom, so we have to assume the last Golis is Yishmael. But let me, let me go over this again. I want to point out the following. Let's go with Chazal for a moment and, and address the Ebenezer Ezra's claim. In mainstream Chazal, by that I mean Gemara and the Midrashim, we always talk about the four, four Galiosas as Bavel, Paras, Yavan, Edaim. Edaim is the last one. However, there is another Medrash, a Medrash, in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer is a late Medrash, it was written later, that actually talks about what you might call a composite fourth Gullus. That the last final Gullus will be a Shutfas, a partnership between Edaim and Yishmael, and even Persia will join that group. So in other words, it all fits together. On one hand, what the Eben Ezra was describing, that a majority of Jews are under the rule of, of Yishmael, is not true. It was true then, it's not true now. So in terms of who are we under, we're largely under Edom, Christian Western civilization. At the same time, the stranglehold that the Arab world has over Edom is very powerful. Whether it's economic in terms of oil, whether it's terrorism. I mean, think about in the aftermath of 9-11 how air travel changed. I mean, I remember days before uh, September 11th, 2001, where you could show up to a, pl to a flight, you know, uh, 20 minutes beforehand and just jump on. So look in terms of how everybody's life has been changed. So what Perkid Rabbi Eliezer is, and, and Rav Chaim Vital said much later, in the 1500s, that the Golas of Yishmael will be the most difficult Golas of all. Because Yishmael is the only nation besides Yisrael that has Hashem's name in their national identity, Kael, Aleph Lamed is Hashem's name. Yishmael has the spiritual merit of circumcision. Yishmael has the spiritual merit of tzniyas in, in dress. In fact, you know, one of the things that, um, I mean, it would be funny if it wouldn't be tragic, you know, um, when some of the Arab countries like Jordan started allowing Jews to, to visit, so at one point, they wanted to stop uh, Jewish tourism from Israel because they said that the teenagers were not dressed appropriately for the Tzniyah standards of their country. Meaning we were, we were not, we were not Tzniyah enough to go to Jordan. I mean, if you think about the def almost the definition of a Chilol Hashem, uh, that is kind of Chilol Hashem. But in a very dark way, Rav Chaim Vital says, based on the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, that Yishmael has spiritual zechuyos. And that makes Yishmael a dangerous enemy. 
An enemy that only has physical power can ultimately be defeated in one way or the other. An enemy that has spiritual power requires a great spiritual power from our side of, of it, meaning we have to fight it with ruchnius. So Rav Chaim Vital, based on Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, did foretell, fore, foretell that the ultimate final gullus will still be gullus edaim. It is gullus edaim, because most of us are living under gullus edaim. But the, the primary negative force in the world will be gullus yishmael, and that will be a very, very dangerous gullus. And in addition, Persia will resurrect itself. Persia, let me remind you, is modern day Iran. And once again, that's the Islamic alliance between the Arab world and the non-Arab Islamic world. And of course, uh, Iran has been an exporter of terrorism uh, for many, many years right now. And Iran represents genocide, after all, because after all, Paras was Haman, right? Coming from, from that place. So in a sense, although the Medrash does not spell out all of the future events, and Rav Chaim Batal does not spell out all of the future events, but the way they describe it is very much descriptive of the world that we live in, in which the dominant power of the Gullus is the Gullus of Edaim, but there will be Malchus Yishmael, and there will be Malchus Paras, that will create a lot of upheaval and a lot of destruction within the world, and Malchus Yishmael in particular is very, very dangerous because they have a spiritual koach that we have to be able to fight. It's an interesting concept of, you might call it dark spiritual energy. I mean, you might wonder, if somebody is a Russia, somebody wants to do bad and evil things, how can we talk about they have spiritual merit that gives them power? Why would Hashem give spiritual power to somebody who wants to do bad things with it. That's a puzzle. I, I don't really have a complete answer, but maybe the best way to at least describe it is that just like there's matter and antimatter, and just like those of you with a good memory might remember the old fashioned cameras, which had film and there were photographic negative, anyone knows, anyone remember that? No, probably not. Negative, positive, right? Uh, so too, spiritual energy has positive forms and spiritual energy has negative forms. And zechuyas can give a person power to do evil as well as do good. And that is kind of the danger of Malchus Yishmael, that they have a dark spiritual energy that gives them a certain empowerment. So in a sense, what we are in is, you might call, Gullus 4.1. So Gullus 4 was Rome. 4.1 is Rome that is connected to Yishmael and Paras in various ways. Now, the, truth, the interesting thing is, in the book of Daniel, you can actually read this tremendous remez, uh, because the book of Daniel describes the Nebuchadnezzar having a dream of a gigantic statue. And the head of the statue was gold. And the arms and the torso were silver. And the legs were copper. And then it says the feet were iron and clay. And then a big stone came and toppled the statue and everything fell down. So Daniel interpreted the dream that the gold is Nebuchadnezzar, the head. The arms and the torso is the second gallus of Persia. The legs, again, the way Chazal understand Daniel, represents Greece. The feet represent Rome. But you'll notice that the feet are mixed with clay. That's how you get the expression clay feet. So that's very beautiful. Like Rav Chaim Batal, the idea is that the Arabs are called clay because they they originally, when they were pagans, they would worship the dust on their feet. And therefore, the metal and the clay is the mixture of Edaim and Yishmael. Okay, so that's how you reconcile it. Uh, it's not an either or. The fourth Gullus is Gullus Edaim, 
but there will be a great powerful influence of Malchus Yishmael. Now, there are two things here. On one hand, Rav Chaim Vital writes from the 1500s that this is going to be awful. Malchus Yishmael will be awful. And as the Rambam wrote, as, as you quoted, uh, even in his time, Malchus Yishmael did worse to us than all of the, the enemies that ever tried to afflict us. Even though the Rambam maintains Islam is not idolatry, but he said, but they were worse than even the Christians. That's what the Rambam says. On the other hand, the Meshech Chachma has a very interesting point. Chazal tell us that Yishmael, after he was expelled with Hagar, eventually when Sarah died, Avraham married a woman whose name was Keturah. Yeah. But Chazal say Keturah was actually Hagar. And she was called Keturah because her deeds were as good as Keturah's. So Hagar apparently became a righteous woman. And Rashi brings Yishmael did Shuvah. Well, Avram really had a great, great bracha that even Yishmael came back and did Shuvah. So this is, uh, this is what Chazal say. Rashi brings this Chazal. So the Meshech Chachma says the following. Since everything that happens to the Avais is a remez as to what will happen in the future, he says, the fact that Yishmael does tshuva will be found in the nation of Yishmael as well. And he actually says that the rise of Islam, which is a monotheistic religion, that replaced the paganism of pre-Islamic Arab world, was a step towards Yishmael doing tshuva. So he saw that as positive, in spite of the persecutions, but it was a positive step towards monotheism, or it is monotheistic. And then I would add that maybe we could augment it with the various steps that some parts of the Arab world are making to make peace with the Jewish people, right? The, the so-called Abrahamic Accords, right? If you go to um, Dubai, right? You, you can see that you know, the Jewish community is growing because they already have machlokas, but they have more than one shul. Which shul do you go to? And I'm sure, I'm sure Dubai is not crowded with uh, you know, so many people. You need two shuls. Which kosher restaurant, whatever it would be. So that's, you know, the, that's the famous old story about a guy that was stranded on a deserted island. And he thought he was all alone. He didn't know what to do. And finally he meets another person, another yid. He says, Baruch Hashem, another yid, at least, at least we're two people together. And the person says, well, yeah, let me show you around. He says, you know, I've been here a long time. And he shows him one building and he says, that's a shul I built with my own hands. And then he shows him another building. He says, oh, that's the other shul I built. He says, what do you need two shuls? He says, oh, one is the shul I daven in and the other is the shul I used to daven in. Uh, but, you know, I, I had to build another one. So we like, we like to fight. Uh, but be this it may, the Abrahamic Accords is a very, very interesting thing because it is a further step in the idea that Yishmael will do tshuva biacharis hayamim. So side by side with Rav Chaim Vital, that Yishmael is the most dangerous of the exiles, side by side, the most dangerous, we also have Yishmael Eiset tshuva. And Ramir Simcha said that was both in terms of Islam, which was a long time ago, and in terms of making shalom with Am Yisrael. So again, you know, we're, obviously we can't really uh, get into great detail about the process of Acharis Hayamim. It's not for us to really understand these things. We will understand them only in hindsight, not while they're happening. But at least uh, B'derech Remes, you can see a lot of connections here to the four exiles and the last exile being a combination of Edaim, Yishmael, and even Paras. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how, if I'm getting this right, but I think the Rav taught in Ashira a while ago um, that the Gura said this is like seven nations and 35 of them get their powers. So how does that, how does that fit in? Yeah, so it actually fits in. Uh, that is true. There is a, a famous uh, thought of the Vilna Gaon uh, regarding the Korbanos of Sukkis that are 70, uh, 70 Korbanos that he says 35 nations in the world 
get their spiritual energy from Esav. It doesn't mean they're descended from Esav, but their spiritual energy is from Esav. And 35 get their spiritual energy from Yishmael. So on the simplest level, it's Christian Islam. I mean, again, uh, Eastern religion, there are a lot of Buddhists in the world and Hindus in the world, but they don't have an impact on the Jewish community. Meaning, in terms of what affects us, it's Christian nations and Islamic nations, right? Those are the ones that involve us. Uh, so it's very easy to say Christian is descended from Edo and uh, uh, Islam is descended from Yishmael. But in a deeper level, uh, which is really the same thing, but I'm just going to say it in a d different way, this is also a remez. The fact that our two enemies are Esau and Yishmael is actually a remez to our own spiritual struggles. Biacharis Hayomim. Because if you look at Esau, although on one hand Esau represents Christianity, on one hand, on the other hand, you also see that Esav represents hedonism and materialism, side by side. Uh, remember that when Yaakov, uh, when Esav needs to have the uh, lentils, the stew, so Yaakov wants to buy the birthright, the right to do the avoda. So what does Esav say? He says, behold, I'm going to die. Hine anochi holech lamas. Behold, I'm going to die. Why do I need a Bechorah? What is Esav really saying? He's not just saying, I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. He's saying, when I die, that's the end of it. There's no Olam Haba, there's no Tchiyas HaMesim, there's no Neshama. All there is, is the body. All there is, is pleasure. All there is, is get what you can as for as long as you can get it. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we shall die. So Esav represents the hedonism that looks at the only purpose in life, if you can call it a purpose, is unlimited enjoyment of physicality and materialism. So when we say 35 nations are Esav nations, that actually means that one of the challenges we're going to face is the materialism and the decadence of a Gashmiistic world. Now, Yishmael, as it morphed into Islam, at least in theory, represents the opposite. They're very religious, devoted to God. They're Moser Nefesh. They're willing to die for their cause, along with killing, killing others uh, in that. And therefore, that represents what you might call religious fanaticism towards evil purposes. So, if Esav represents hedonistic materialism, Yishmael represents religious fanaticism for bad. One is kind of ignoring God and the other is besmirching God. One is kind of putting God out of, out of the way and the other is using the Shem Hashem for bad things. And the suggestion is that Klal Yisrael is going to be buffeted by those two enemies. And one could even say further that even within my own personality, I struggle with the Esav in me and the Yishmael within me. So the ace of in me says, don't get up for davening and don't go to shear. Sleep, eat, right? enjoy yourself. That's coming from the ace of in me. The Ishmael in me is when you look down at other Jews and you call them apikorsim and kofrim. It's kind of, I, I'm, I'm not drawing a moral equivalent to, to Ishmael. I'm not saying you're a terrorist if you behave that way. But it's coming from the Ishmael idea of using religion to denigrate and be mavaza other other people. So it's not only something we face from the outside, it's actually a struggle that we face from the inside. Yeah. What I mean is, are we going to say that Yavon is connected to Esav and um, Persia is connected to Yishma? I mean, it sounds binary. Like, it doesn't seem like there's really a Nachkamim between them. Well, well, yes, because, because uh, although they are different nations, I mean, there are 70 nations, so we're not saying every nation is Yishmael and every nation is Esav. In fact, the truth is none of the 17 nations are descended from Esav and Yishmael. They're all from the other sons of Noah. But it means that um, it's like the spiritual evils they represent got concretized in their purest form in Esav and Yishmael and all of the other nations get their thing kind of from, from that. Yes, yeah, so Yavan would be connected to Edom as well. Of course, like the Eben Ezra, that's very clear because he, he lumps Yavan and Edom as one as one as one goes, yeah. Did you say that the last Islamic empire that controlled Eretz Israel, they weren't, I mean, they were Turkish, they weren't 
a smile. And they had their they had their capital in New Rome, Constantinople, Istanbul, and they even called them they didn't even refer to themselves as the Turkish Empire, they called themselves Rome. So would like Rome. So would you say they're Rome or were they are they or would they be Ishmael? You know, it's, it's it is a little complicated because the truth is um, ethnic groups are changing, so to speak, and uh, the Ottoman Empire, which controlled Eretz Israel for what four hundred years, a, a pretty pretty long time, uh, were not Arabs, right? So are they called Bnei Yisrael? So it's so it's very interesting that um, some sources call them Yavan, call them Greece, because they looked at them as the heirs to Constantinople and the like. Uh, others still st still treated them as Bnei Yishmael because at that point, just like Rome morphed into Christianity, Yishmael morphed into Islam. So as a result, any Muslim was considered to be connected to Yishmael, even though they were no longer an ethnic. Uh, they were not ethnically connected, but kind of you know, Islam became Yishmael, and therefore you're a Muslim. You're you're from Yishmael in a spiritual. Spiritual sense. Okay, so again, um, this is far afield from the story of Hanukkah per se, but we will get back there. I think if you get a broader perspective, uh, you'll appreciate the story of Hanukkah. So, see you tomorrow.